2. The Unseen Enemy Secular Humanism Humanism is the second oldest religion known to man. It goes back to the Garden of Eden and to the Tempter's Creed as set forth in Genesis 3, 1-5. Its first article of faith is the belief that all things, including every word from God, must be put to the test of man's reason and experience. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? To take any word from God on faith is held to be irrationalism and bad religion. In the United States, in 1987, a book by Osborne Segerberg, Jr., a Unitarian, takes a more favourable attitude towards Jesus than is common among American Unitarians. In The Riddles of Jesus and the Answers of Science, the author finds, he believes, quote, modern verification of his wisdom and how it can help you. Subtitled to book, Segerberg takes a critical view of such biblical scholars as Reimarus, Strauss, Bauer, Weiss and Schweitzer. Science, he holds, has confirmed many of the insights of Jesus, a genius and, quote, in the resurrection was the promise of the fate of all human beings, end quote. Segerberg does not see Jesus as the Son of God, as our atonement, nor as Lord, but rather as an evidence of human potentiality. Segerberg is a humanist. A humanist can at times believe in God to a degree, but basically as a resource for man rather than as Lord or sovereign. Many churchmen who profess to believe the Bible from cover to cover are humanists who come to Christianity not to be used by the Lord, but to use Him. At the time of the American War of Independence, Samuel Hopkins saw the developing humanism of the Church with God as the great resource rather than Lord. He developed a test question for members and prospective members. Are you willing to be damned for the glory of God? He was not demanding hypocrisy, not anything more than to shock people into an awareness that we must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness or justice. Matthew 6.33 We are saved to serve God and his glory, and this may mean the loss of many things. This means, in the words of Luther's hymn, Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is for ever. The attitude, yea, hath God said, tolerates only a positive word from God and man. It sees the chief end of God as serving man, so that man may enjoy himself forever. Humanism in the church sees Christ as our great fire and life insurance agent, not as the Lord. The second article of faith for humanism is this, ye shall not surely die. It premises that it is possible that man's science, given enough time, will overcome the problems of death together with all other social problems. This view separates death from sin, whereas scripture is emphatic on their connection. By man's sin came death, and only by Christ's death and resurrection can atonement and resurrection come to man. 1 Corinthians 15, 21, etc. For the Christian, the connection of sin and death is inescapable, both for men and nations. Moreover, for us, death is not a natural fact. God made all things very good, Genesis 1, 31, but man's sin separated him from God and therefore life. Sin is the source of death, and death is a supernatural fact of judgment by the Almighty. As long as we view death in isolation from sin and as a natural fact, we are prone to humanism. Third, for the tempter and for humanism, his religion, it follows that disobedience to God is the beginning of wisdom. In the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. He says thereby that as long as we in faith believe and obey every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, Matthew 4.4, 4, our eyes are not open and we are blind. For humanism, 
faith in the Lord is the beginning of ignorance, and disobedience opens our eyes and makes us wise. We are told, quote, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Genesis 3, six. The tempter's counsel was, Be wise, apostatize. Fourth, this wisdom means playing God. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. To know has here the force of to determine. Ye shall determine for yourself what constitutes good and evil. Every man will be his own source of law and morality. Instead of allowing God to provide them with all their laws, men will become their own lawmakers. It is noteworthy that during the Commonwealth era, the New England missionary John Eliot converted and organized the Indians into self-governing villages, all ruled by God's law. On the accession of Charles II to the throne in 1660, the crime ministers ruled that royal law, not God's law, had to govern. The communities were broken up and all copies of Eliot's, the Christian Commonwealth, were ordered burned by the public hangman. Only two copies survived. The premise of modern culture the world over is Genesis 3.5. Every man as his own God and lawgiver. The death sentence pronounced on Adam's stands against all nations because they called such evils as abortion, homosexuality and euthanasia good and good evil. Humanism is commonly called secular humanism. The word secular has many meanings. The one of concern to us is a layman, or of the laity. Secular humanism is only in rare cases an openly avowed and or an officially recognised state religion. Most frequently it is the faith practised by all too many men in the church and out of it, in the halls and courts of state and in everyday life. Underneath the surface of established Christianity, secular humanism is widespread and commonly prevails. As a result, we are in a cultural revolution. It is a revolution from the new man, Jesus Christ, to the old man, Adam, from supernatural man to fallen man. This is the culture of the Enlightenment, of Romanticism and Revolution, of Rousseau and of our time. This is a common opinion in our culture that fallen man, as he is, is good and he needs self-expression and gratification. Our rebellion against Christ reveals itself in the common idealization of primitive peoples. The Melanesians were cannibals. Transvestites and homosexuals are common among them. Their women suckle their young pigs at their breasts. Looking at these people, one naturalist has said, It is wrong to force people to change. We, he declares, cannot teach these people the way of happiness. They could be our teachers in being at peace with ourselves and our environment, and their homes are sanctuaries of humanity. In line with this is the trend of state officers in the United States to view the Bible as a child abuse handbook because it calls for the disciplining and chastisement of unruly children. This attitude is even more pronounced in Sweden. The child is innocent, unfallen and sacrosanct, and the Bible, therefore, is regarded as evil and unfit as a guide for family life. Herman Huxma stated powerfully the difference between the faith of fallen man and the faith of the redeemed. Quote, the natural man would never give the answer which the Heidelberg Catechism puts in the mouth of its pupils in reply to the fifth question. I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbour. He is even offended at this truth. He far prefers his own philosophy. Man may fail occasionally. He may blunder. There may even be some that habitually sin, but inherently he's good, and he loves to extol his own virtues and sing the praises of his good deeds in public. Only it must be understood that this lie concerning himself 
This closing of his eyes to the righteous judgment of God is not due to any lack of natural light. The lie is an ethical one, not an intellectual mistake in judgment. Just as the fool saith in his heart that there is no God, so he persuades himself of his own goodness. Man lives in the sphere of the lie, both with regard to God and with respect to himself. End quote. There is an aspect of humanism and of all anti-Christianity which we must never forget. It is suicidal. Our Lord is the way, the truth and the life. To be outside of him is to be separated from life to death. We are told by wisdom, quote, For whoso findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favour of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hit me Love death, Proverbs 8, 35 and 36. The culture of humanism is thus a doomed one. The Lord declares, quote, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, Revelation 18, 4. Humanism all around us is consuming the Christian capital of the Western world and is descending rapidly into disaster and death. Our humanistic culture resembles the tiny Pacific island Republic of Nauru with 3,600 millionaires. Nauru annually exports 2 million tons of phosphate, which means that the island is rapidly disappearing. As of approximately 1976, three-fourths of the land had disappeared, and it has been estimated that by 1990 only bare rock will be let, or no soil. The rich people of Nauru, meanwhile, have the highest consumption of alcohol in the Pacific and their 15 miles of highway have thousands of expensive automobiles. The Christian capital of the West is rapidly disappearing. Unless it is replenished, the West has no future and has nothing to give to the nations other than death. Rome fell because it was dead within. Seneca a quote-unquote moral philosopher, led others into immorality. He was Nero's teacher in vice as well as philosophy. In the four peak years of his connections with power, he amassed a fortune of over $15 million in terms of the value of the dollar over over a century ago. The sum of Seneca's wisdom was simply this, quote, The aim of all philosophy is to despise life, end quote. In our age, too, various philosophies manifest a like temper. On the level of practice, we see anti-life as reigning motive, abortion, homosexuality, euthanasia and more. Fertility is seen as a problem by people who hate life. Another manifestation is a hatred of justice and innocence. Lord Diplock of the British House of Lords a few years ago referred to the American rules of criminal law and the suppression of evidence because of those rules as a view of, quote, the irrelevance of guilt, end quote. A California justice, Macklin Fremling, devoted the chapter in his study of the price of perfect justice to, quote, the irrelevance of guilt, end quote. This should not surprise us in a world at war with our Lord, a world that says, Yea, hath God said, Guilt has a privileged status among men who are themselves guilty before God. In one country after another, people are forbidden to speak the facts about criminal groups or classes because they are more protected by law than are the law-abiding. I've heard it declared by professors and students that the Christian and white peoples of the world are the greatest force for evil known to history. The guilty are indicting the innocent, and the anti-Christians are insisting that Christ and the Bible are the root of all evil. In the United States, a daughter of one of America's more prominent families started a call-girl service, a prostitution operation for the affluent meal, using college girls. She justified herself, declaring that she was rendering a social service and defining morality as hypocrisy. Such attitudes are more and more commonplace and even more aggressively asserted. It has been rightly observed that, as the homosexuals came out of the closet, 
the Christians went in. The Lord requires us to be dominion men. The Great Commission is a mandate to disciple all nations, teaching them the whole word of God, Matthew 28, 18-20. It is called the Great Commission because it is a summation of the commission to Joshua, now expanded in scope from Palestine to the whole world. That commission declares, in part, quote, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given unto you, as I said unto Moses, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Joshua 1.3, 5-9